Good evening, everybody. Welcome to tonight's presentation, Quota Quickies, The Worst Films Ever Made, with Lance Napper. My name is Nikki Smith. I work for Westminster Libraries. My colleague, uh, Nina, who works for Kensington Libraries, is producing in the background. So thank you very much, Nina. Um, to introduce Lawrence, uh, Lawrence is a lecturer at King's College University. He's an expert on um, films of the interwar years. He's written books on the um, cult culture of, sorry, I'm scrolling down your list, Lawrence. It's very embarrassing. He's written books on silent cinema, on um, the great war in, in popular British cinema in the 1920s, and British cinema and middle brow culture in the interwar years. He also runs an excellent blog called At The Pictures, though I noticed today it really should be up to date. It really should be um, updated because the last last one was, was at the beginning of the pandemic. So welcome to tonight's presentation. This is going to be a bit of a technological breakthrough because uh, we're actually, Lawrence has made a film. So although Lawrence is here and I'm going to invite him to introduce it, he's, he's, going, to do a, he's going to show a film. Um, meanwhile, please use the Q&A to ask questions and we're going to have a chat with him afterwards. So welcome, Lawrence. Hello, everybody. Um, I can't see whether I'm actually there on the screen. Oh, there I am, yes. Um, so yes, I've made a film um, to stop me from being from freaking out. Um, but I am here and I will pop back up later on. So I'm going to share the film now and I hope you enjoy it. Okay, my name is Lawrence Napper. Um, I'd like to thank Nikki Smith and also the Westminster Libraries for inviting me to do this cork, cork talk. And I'd also like to invite in to thank you uh, for coming along to hear me talk about Quota Quickies. Were they the worst films ever made? Well, I guess I'm going to give some sort of uh, answer to that question in the course of the talk, but also like to invite you to come up with a conclusion yourself. Actually, you can see Quota Quickies relatively easily nowadays. That didn't always used to be the case. Um, they come up on Talking Pictures TV uh, quite often. Uh, and in fact, if you live uh, near London, um, uh, myself and Dominic Delargy have been putting on a series of screenings of uh, Quota Quickies at the Kino Cinema in Bermondsey. Um, and these, these screenings are followed by uh, kind of question and answer sessions with invited guests. You can see the list of the upcoming screenings there. Um, we've actually just, we've already done two of them. Uh, we showed the ghost camera at the beginning uh, of the season and we showed Death at Broadcasting House uh, last week. So, but if you can't manage to get to those screenings, you can always download and listen to the podcast um, that Dom produces uh, as a result of the discussions that, uh, that happen about those quota quickies. Um, and if you're interested in any of that, um, you can uh, put Kino Quickies into Google and you'll come up with all the details, both of the screenings and of the podcasts. It'd be great to see some of you there if you're interested. So, well, are Quota Quickies the worst films ever made? What even are Quota Quickies? What is the quota? Those are the kinds of things I'm going to start talking about, I think, uh, uh, today. Um, and first, I'm going to just kind of describe to you what the quota is um, and what the situation that led towards the quota uh, was. So let's do that now. OK, so uh, the British Films Quota was the result of a piece of uh, legislation enacted by the government in 1928. Um, the Cinematograph Act of 1928. Um, and the Cinematograph Act was really a response to the kind of, you know, the declining position of British cinema um, as an industry really throughout the 1920s. And, and I mean, I guess the kind of obvious reason for that sort of decline uh, of British uh, uh, film production is competition from America, from Hollywood. Uh, so by the mid 1920s, really 90% of the films shown on British screens were American. Um, and there was kind of increasing concern, not only about uh, the kind of effect of that on British culture, but also about the, 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 the actual whether Brit British cinema itself, whether British film production could survive at all. There's kind of various reasons for this sort of, uh, I guess, imbalance. Um, uh, the most obvious one, of course, is that Hollywood is very efficient um, and it's also uh, in a very good position in that, um, you know, the American film 
the, the American exhibition market is massive. So if you make a film in America and you distribute it in America, it doesn't have to actually do that well at the box office to give you a return on your investment because there are so many cinemas that it can go into. There's such a huge audience. Um, by contrast, if you think about a British film producer, um, you know, even if they make a successful film, the potential audience in Britain for that film is much, much smaller. So they've got much less potential money coming back to them through the box office. Um, and of course, what that means is that British films kind of they look a bit smaller, they look a bit cheaper. Um, they very rarely can break into the American market for a variety of reasons. Um, uh, and even in the British market themselves, the British market itself, they are competing against um, much more expensive, much more lavish Hollywood productions. Um, this is also kind of effect. This also affects the way that um, uh, films get uh, financed. So uh, while in Hollywood th they're already in a kind of a period of vertical integration, where there's quite sort of steady flow of finance, um, like going from the box office back into the studios to fund further productions, um, and where the studios themselves own the uh, chains of cinemas, but actually it's, it's probably more accurate to say the chains of cinemas own the studios. In the UK, that's not the case. Um, so the, the, the cinemas and the cinema chains are independent of the studios um, and the studios themselves, they don't have that kind of regular uh, kind of uh, finance um, coming into them through the previous films that they've made. In fact, most studios, you know, most films are made on a kind of film by film financing basis. So they go to the city, they ask the financiers to borrow money, um, they make their film, and then they have to wait for the film to, 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 to come out and kind of get money through the box office to then pay back those financiers, um, which creates a kind of problem, particularly if uh, the situation in the 1920s pertains where um, there are so many films coming from Hollywood that uh, cinemas are quite often booked up for, you know, a year in advance. So you might go to a to a cinema manager and say, well, look, I've got this great British film I've just made. You know what I think? And they'll be like, well, yeah, I mean, I, I, I'm quite interested in showing it, although it looks quite cheap, really. Um, but I'm, I can't possibly show it for a whole year. So then you have to go back to your your investors and you can say, well, I know I owe you a load of money, but like I can't pay you back for a whole year. But anyway, can you can you give me some more money so I can make another film? And of course, the investors are very unkeen to do that. So there's a sort of stagnation, really, in terms of the financing and the kind of the industrial structures of the British uh, production system, partly as a result of the strength of the Hollywood product within the cinemas. And there's a sense in which, if you think about it, that's, uh, you know, the British cinema, there are, there are various, I guess, vested interests. So for the cinema managers, like, what do they care? They've got loads and loads of Hollywood films coming in. They're coming in very cheap because, in fact, they are, they've made their money back in Hollywood. So American distributors can actually offer them to British uh, exhibitors very cheaply. Um, uh, and they're also very popular. Um, so, like, British exhibitors, really, cinema managers don't have, you know, they don't owe British film producers anything much. Um, British distributors, Quite often, the distributors for those Hollywood films are, in fact, of course, the Hollywood companies themselves or um, uh, offshoots of the Hollywood companies. So they're not really that interested in supporting British production. It's only the British producers who, you know, conceive of this as a real problem. Well, that's not really true. It's the British producers and the British government. And I guess it's worth thinking about, well, why would the British government be anxious about the parlous state of the British production industry? And there are there are various reasons for that, I guess, various reasons that become uh, more and more important as the debate goes through the 1920s and we start getting the kind of lobbying that results in the Cinematograph Act of 1928. Um, so the first argument is, you know, it's an industry and, you know, like any other industry, it employs British people, um, it, uh, it generates a kind of product that can be sold um, and can generate profit and therefore taxes. So you know, you could think of the British film industry as like any other industry uh, for Britain that sort of needs some sort of help, needs protection, needs some sort of legislation from the government to help it uh, continue. And of course, there's a sense in which that is still true today of the British industry and of loads of other industries. Um, and uh, what we have today is kind of protection for the British industry through national lottery, through tax breaks, uh, through various different mechanisms. Um, so, and, and, and that what we have today is what they're lobbying to be put in place in the 1920s.
Um, second reason why the government might be interested in kind of supporting uh, British production as opposed to American production is uh, the, a notion that is still current today um, and is certainly uh, uh, very much a feature of those debates in the 1920s, which is this idea that trade follows the film. which is kind of product placement, basically, we're talking about. Um, so there's this conception that um, if you have a British film uh, and you you show it to British audiences, but you can also perhaps export it elsewhere, particularly to the empire in the 1920s, um, then that British film will contain products like cars, you know, fashions, these kinds of things that that are produced in Britain and which are through the film sold to audiences around the globe. Um, and that again, that's that's still very much a kind of idea that is current uh, in today's thinking around uh, kind of the importance of kind of film and I guess soft power uh, that film brings with it. Um, and the third uh, question is this sort of the third incentive for supporting the British film industry is a cultural one. And it, I suppose it is about soft power. It's about the ability of film to um, kind of take around the globe ideas of what Britishness is and what British values are. Um, but there's also a sort of negative to that, which is a series of concerns that have been sort of increasing in the 1920s and would increase throughout the 1930s around Americanization, around the anxiety of about the dominance of Hollywood and its effect on British national life. Um, uh, that's already happening in the 1920s. Of course, it gets much worse in the 1930s um, when talkies come in uh, because uh, you, there's this idea that somehow people are going to stop talking, stop talking with British accents, um, and they're not. They're going to they're going to stop thinking in British ways. I think is some of the argument. And as an example of that, here this is a Punch uh, cartoon from the mid 1930s, which really sort of makes fun of that idea or kind of riffs on that idea. You've got two. I suppose quintessentially little old ladies sitting in the cinema watching a Hollywood gangster movie and one turns to the other and she says oh do you see do you see what they're doing there Emily they're taking him for a ride presently we shall see them sock him and possibly bump him off so of course you know punches hilarious joke is that these little old ladies are basically talking in the slang of American gangsters um but actually there's quite a lot of relatively serious um, uh, columnists and commentators worrying about the effect that British that American films have on British youth, particularly British teenagers, uh, on the ways in which those British youth have, are starting to consume American goods and American fashions uh, because they've been sort of, you know, they've been persuaded to, that those are the coolest things to have uh, through Hollywood films. And so these are some of the reasons why um, uh, the Cinematograph Act becomes something that the government is kind of interested in supporting. There are various debates about like what form it will take. You know, is it going to be an act which basically guarantees finance for British films? Is it going to be, so there's lots of discussion about this idea of a film's bank. Um, is it going to be some other kind of way of restricting uh, Hollywood uh, uh, distributors, like taxing them uh, or putting a kind of import tax into Hollywood on, onto Hollywood films, these kinds of questions. Um, and in fact, I mean, what comes up is a sort of a kind of compromise between all of the different parties. Um, uh, and that is this idea of a British films quota. So you've got three different players in the film industry. You've got the exhibitors, that is the cinema managers who are showing the films. Um, you've got the distributors who are the people who are offering the films for rent to the cinema managers. And then you've got the producers who are the people who are making the films, whether they be, you know, the Hollywood studios or whether they be British uh, film producers. Um, and the Quota Act works by saying that by law, exhibitors must show a certain percentage of the of the films that they show must be British made. Um, and by law, obviously, they can't do that unless the distributors are offering them British films for rent. So a larger percentage of British films uh, have to be offered by the distributors in order for the exhibitors to have a choice of British films to show. Um, and uh, and the and obviously the kind of the producers are the producers of the British films, but they are also um, Hollywood producers. So Hollywood producers have distribution arms in the UK and those distribution arms must also offer British films uh, to their uh, customers. 
So there's a sense in which um, what the quota does is it forces Hollywood to offer British films to some of a uh, certain percentage of British films to their customers. And those percentages, they they start relatively low, around five or six percent at the beginning of the act. The act runs for 10 years. And by the end of the act, it's sort of 25 percent um, of uh, films that are being shown must be British films. Um, there are all kinds of clauses about how you define a British film. Um, and one of the key things uh, that happens, of course, is that um, uh, the uh, the financial interests of the producers are not defined nationally. So you can have an American company paying a British producer to make a British film. Um, and so the money is neither here nor there. And that is, I suppose, what really leads to the quota quickie. OK, just to be clear, quota quickies are an unintentional result of the Quota Act. The intentions of the Act were that it should open up space for respectable, pucka, expensive British films uh, in the British exhibition market. Um, and that therefore it would encourage, it would both um, uh, make a sort of stability for existing British producers, um, but also encourage new British producers um, to start making uh, kind of respectable, expensive, you know, ambitious films. Um, and indeed, that that actually, that it, most importantly, it would create some sort of confidence among city financiers that the film production industry was a sort of pucker thing to invest in, and it would release finance capital. And indeed, actually, you know, that did happen. So to a certain extent, uh, the Cinematograph Act was was a completely successful. Um, a huge amount of financial uh, finance capital was released um, as a result of the confidence that the Act had given um, that British films had a future. And as a result of that sort of um, uh, uh, kind of optimistic moment, um, a series of vertically and integrated British film companies emerged. So that is uh, companies where the uh, the uh, chain of uh, cinemas and the distribution arm and the studios are all owned by the same company. So British International Pictures, um, which famously employed Hitchcock when he was making blackmail, um, is one of these vertically integrated companies. And I suppose the most famous vertically integrated company is a company which emerges in this moment uh, is a company called Gaumont British, which is presided over by Michael Balkan, uh, the doyen of British uh, producers, um, and which produces, again, Hitchcock's most famous kind of golden sex tetter films, um, but also the, uh, the, the series of uh, Jesse Matthews musicals, which are absolutely intended to be exported to Hollywood to be international productions. Um, so on some levels, you could say, you know, the Quota Act is very successful in giving a boost to British cinema. Um, but there are other players uh, who uh, respond to the Quota Act in perhaps less honourable ways. Um, and those are, in fact, those American distributors um, who really have no incentive to support the British film industry. You know, they've got a full roster. If you think, if you are MGM, let's say, you've got a full roster of your own films uh, ready to rent out to uh, British uh, exhibitors. Um, you know, they are big, successful movies starring big, successful people like, you know, Judy Garland and Mickey Rooney and Greta Garbo and so forth and so on. Um, and like, why would you want to spend money on some ludicrous sort of regulation that means that you have to somehow suddenly finance a whole load of other films in Britain? Um, and that is actually the ways in which a lot of quote, uh, a lot of American um, companies approached the Quota Act. And what they do as a result is they produce quota quickies. So they employ independent British uh, film producers to make as many films as possible, as quickly and as cheaply as possible, um, so that you can comply with the letter of the law. You can say, well, look, I've got, I've got 13 films, 13 British films on my books that I'm offering to exhibitors that they can show and they are British films. Um, but actually, you don't really care whether those films are attractive to those exhibitors at all, at all. You know, they could be really, really drossy and really, really crap. And of course, that's the reputation that Quota Quickies have is that they're really, really drossy and really, really crap. But actually, if you look, 
more closely into the detail of those responses to the Quota Act, those initial responses, it becomes a slightly more complicated uh, picture. So MGM really famously um, sort of got round the quota legislation initially by keeping on their books a lot of silent films. You know, so the transition to sound comes just after the Quota Act is passed. Um, in around, it's about 1929, early 1930, that in Britain, you know, it tips over into pre predominantly sound cinema. Um, and, you know, MGM is quite happy to say, well, you know, we do have all these British produced films. They happen to be silent, so what? Um, and they, they also hold on their books, you know, films from uh, India that are produced in India, which, you know, clearly, well, not, not actually clearly, in fact, um, but they just sort of think, well, no, no exhibitor is going to want to show these. So like we've got them on the books, like nobody can prosecute us, but actually we can just go right ahead and show our MGM product. MGM is quite an extreme example of this, actually. Most other companies find a sort of slightly a middle way. So um, uh, most famously, uh, Warner Brothers actually open a studio in the UK, they take over Teddington Studios and they produce their own quota product. Um, and yes, it is very cheap. Uh, it, it is made very quickly, um, but it, you know, it, it, it is sort of, it is presided over by Warner Brothers as a Warner Brothers producer there. And indeed there are connections with uh, the, uh, the American company. So most famously uh, Errol Flynn, uh, it, you know, starts out at Warner Brothers in Teddington um, and he's spied by producers in Hollywood uh, who are like, oh, yes, who's this starring in one of our British films? You know, he'll be quite good. Let's bring him over. So and I suppose there's, that's kind of indicative of some of the ways in which uh, Hollywood uh, uh, companies uh, operate their quota system. I, I think uh, 20th Century Fox also does this. They have a studio at, uh, at Wembley where they produce quota product um, and other producers, other uh, Hollywood uh, um, um, uh, companies they actually have sort of relatively long term relationships with British producers. And I guess uh, the most sort of the best example of that is RKO, uh, who employ a guy called Julius Hagen, who has a studio who is running out of a studio in Twickenham um, to produce their quota product. Um, and actually, a lot of the stuff that we kind of know about what it was like to make quota quickies at this time kind of comes from uh, the Julius Hagen's uh, company. Um, and Hagen, he ran, uh, I mean, one of the important things, I guess, is that quite a lot of those Julius Hagen films survive. The Warner Brothers uh, Teddington films, not many of them survive. Uh, you'll be aware of the fact that many films from this period were destroyed or just don't survive because of the, the, the fact that nitrate uh, celluloid is uh, an unstable medium. Um, but the, the Julius Hagen films survive. Um, and and also uh, some of the uh, directors who made films for Julius Hagen have sort of talked about what it was like to work there. So, well, I mean, you know, what was it like to work there? One of the key things about making a film really cheaply is that the, the, is, you know, the most important economy you can make is to make them fast. Yeah, because, you know, the, the major expense is that you are occupying a studio, you've got a whole staff, technical staff behind the camera staff and a, and a cast, you know, that's the, that's where the expense comes. Um, and uh, uh, Julius Hagen uh, Studios famously made films within a week or two weeks, like that was that was how long you had to make a film. Um, and uh, what else is famous uh, about Hagen Studios is that they made films 24 hours a day. So what they would have is they would have two films under production at any one time. Um, one film would be made during the day. Um, and then when they went home, another production company would come in and do the night shift, making a second film. And you can quite often see that in Hagen Productions because they reuse the sets, obviously, because they're always already set up. So you quite often get um, uh, uh, sets that really look very similar on two different Julius Hagen Productions. Um, the other thing about uh, the other thing that's sort of said about it, Bernard Vorhaus says this about working for Julius Hagen is that if you if you went over your your schedule, he simply strode into the studio floor and ripped six pages out of the script for every day that you went over. So uh, the other thing that's kind of, uh, I guess, um, uh, key about these films is they don't have much production time. They don't have much pre-production time. The scripts are written very hurriedly. And then they're actually, they're quite often rewritten um, 
as the film is shooting. Um, uh, there's quite a lot of kind of uh, relatively affectionate uh, discussions of what it was like to make films for Hagen. Um, people called him Uncle Julius, supposedly, um, but he did work people very hard. One of the things that um, uh, Vorhaus says is that as long as you made your film in the time that he said you should make it, he would allow you a certain amount of freedom. So, for instance, when he casts Ida Lupino for the ghost camera, he's talking about casting Ida Lupino for the ghost camera, and he says, you know, actually, one of the things about Hagen was that you could, he wouldn't, he didn't mind spending money on actors. Um, he didn't mind taking a punt on actors, but he also didn't mind spending money on actors as long as you got your film uh, kind of uh, completed on time. Bernard Vorhaus tells another story, which is quite a good illustration of the conditions under which uh, quota quickies were produced uh, with Julius Hagen's studio. Um, it's about Dusty Ehrman, a film that he makes in 1933, 34. Um, uh, he talks about sort of, you know, um, uh, preparing the script for Dusty Ehrman, um, but that he himself was very keen on skiing and he sort of saw an opportunity and, and he went to see Julius Hagen and said, well, you know, I wonder if you'd let me go to the Alps and make this film. We could do some great location shooting, it'd be relatively cheap. You know, what do you think? We could, we could make it a skiing movie. What do you think about that? And uh, Julius Hagen, whose office was the bar of the pub over the road, said, no, my dear boy, no way, that's not going to happen. Um, and Bernard Vorhaus just kind of went back home and sort of licked his wounds a little bit. But uh, two, three days before shooting was about to start on Dusty Ehrman, when he had in fact completed the script and everything was ready to go, um, Julius Hagen called him back into his office, the bar of the St. Margaret's pub, and said, you know, dear boy, I think, you know, you should be able to, yes, I think, I think, I think I'm going to let you go and, you know, shoot this, this picture, some of this picture in the outs, off you go. Um, obviously, you start shooting on Monday, so, you know, get going and book your tickets. Um, and Bernard Vorhaus is like, well, no, I, I don't think I, I don't have time to do, I, I, can't, I can't rewrite the script now, you know, I, I'll need another week. And Julius Hagen is like, no, 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 you can rewrite the script on the plane or on the boat, you know, it's like you aren't going to be given any more time. You will be shooting on Monday and you'll be shooting the Alps. Off you go. Bye. Um, and so, you know, Bernard Vorhaus very hurriedly rewrites his picture uh, and does, in fact, shoot some of the material in the Alps and clears out of the studio um, for the three days that he's due to be in there. And only later does he discover that, of course, the reason uh, why Hagen allowed him uh, to do that is because another production company has approached Hagen, is in a bit of a bind. You know, they've lost their studio. They're already in the middle of production. They need a studio really urgently. And Hagen can effectively charge what he likes for the studio rental space. So he's quite happy. Um, uh, uh, for Bernard Vorhaus to leave and go to the Alps. And in fact, the extra money he's going to make from uh, this incoming uh, unit is going to pay for that trip to the Alps and pay for Dusty Irvin to look a little bit more glamorous than it previously would have done. Um, I mean, that's just a sort of one of many, really many stories that are told about Hagen and about the sort of, um, you know, the kind of breakneck speed of production, the kinds of ways in which people work. Actresses talk about uh, sleeping uh, on couches on the set, uh, not going home because this, they work so late and they start so early in the morning that they can't go home. So they're just sort of sleeping around in, 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 in bits of the studio. Um, uh, uh, Maurice Elvey talks about how um, he had to persuade um, uh, Julius Hagen that actually uh, he couldn't get people working at these kinds of uh, lengths of hours without feeding them and um, uh, he and Hagen's wife basically cooked up a whole load of stews and served big suppers uh, for the cast and crew as they came off and went on uh, to the floor just to you know keep them alive. Um, there are all kinds of stories like this uh, floating around I guess about Hagen's uh, 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 operation. One of the other things to sort of note about Quota Quickies, I think, um, uh, that is quite often said, is the way in which it offers, uh, that industry uh, offers both a landing strip and a runway for particular uh, kinds of filmmakers. Um, so I've mentioned Julius Haig, uh, I've mentioned Bernard Vorhaus, you know, 
making films for Julius Hagen is his kind of first gig, really. Um, and in fact, he doesn't really go on to do much else. He's uh, He does stay in the film industry. He goes on to make um, uh, relatively, he doesn't make any more feature films. He goes back to Hollywood and kind of is quite kind of peripheral, really, in the film industry. But there are other people who start out in Hagen's studio and start out in Quota Quickies more generally, who become very big. So famously, um, uh, one of uh, Bernard Vorhaus's films uh, is edited, the ghost camera is edited by David Lean. Um, and editing is actually a quite a, I mean, it's a key thing for Quota Quickies, obviously, um, because you have to have a really skilled editor because actually you probably don't have that much coverage in terms of the actual footage that's been that's been shot. Um, and Lean starts out um, his career uh, working in Quota Quickie Studios. Um, uh, quite a few uh, kind of uh, filmmakers do that. Michael Powell very famously um, starts out, you know, his first directing gigs are for Quota Quickie films. Um, and then, of course, he goes into sort of more pucker uh, film production. Um, so it's a it's a it's a it's a runway for some filmmakers, but it's also a landing strip. Um, so Morris Elvey, well, actually, Morris Elvey is, is kind of uh, has got a remarkable career that goes from the very beginning uh, of cinema, really, to sort of, you know, the, the, the 50s and 60s. Um, but for instance, um, there are some there are quite a few British filmmakers who were quite big filmmakers in the 1920s who wind up in making quota quickies. George Pearson, who had had uh, major success with a film called Squibs uh, in the early 1920s and continued to make major British films throughout the 1920s ends up in the early 1930s working uh, in Quota Quickie Studios. Um, Adrian Brunel, similarly, you know, he had some of the biggest hits of 1920s British cinema, um, but he winds up uh, making Quota Quickies. Um, so there's a sort of, there's this sense in which uh, there are kind of, there are a sort of melting pot of the industry, um, both in terms of young people really starting out and kind of getting their experience and of of, of more veteran producers and directors who are just sort of sliding into retirement. Okay, well, I guess that's enough about um, how Quota Quickies came about and how they got made. Um, one clear question to ask is, well, what were they like? Were they, in fact, any good or any bad? Um, uh, Michael Balkan very famously said that, you know, um, Quota Quickies never really got seen by anybody. They were never intended to be seen by anybody. The most they could uh, get was uh, the most exposure they might have was to be shown in the cinemas at 11 o'clock in the morning when the cleaners were cleaning before the actual, before the, before the real audiences came in sort of around about midday. Um, I think you don't really have to see that many quota quickies to realize that that's sort of nonsense. Um, it may be that MGM didn't care whether they got seen or not because, you know, by having them on their books, they'd complied with the letter of the law. But the filmmakers certainly, it's perfectly clear, did as much as they could to make these films as entertaining as possible, given the constraints that they were under. I'm going to talk a little bit later about how the films were distributed and we'd like, you know, what cinemas they went into and how they were publicised. But here I just want to like talk a little bit about the kinds of things that you might want to look out for if you're worrying about whether a film that you're watching is a quota quickie or not. And uh, one thing to say, of course, is that they're all very different. You know, they range from being absolutely dreadful and, and as cheap as absolutely possible to being actually sort of reasonably expensive you know that there's there's no there's no there's no uh, budget cutoff point where you can say well this stops being a quota quickie and starts being a low budget comedy um and indeed i mean you could say there are some quota quickies that only exist because their american distributors just wanted to do that you know just wanted to comply with the letter of the law and distribute their own stuff um but there are other quota quickies that that, that, that actually aren't distributed by American distributors, they're distributed elsewhere, but they wouldn't have existed if the, if the legislation wasn't there to protect that area of the market. So it's quite difficult to say, you know, when a quota cookie shades into a low budget uh, uh, film. But there are some key things that are, I suppose you could say, features of quota cookies. And the first really obvious feature of a quota cookie is that it is relatively short. It is 60 minutes long it has to be 60 min minutes um the legislation stipulates that you know this applies to feature films and their definition of a feature film is 60 minutes but they're very much 
they're not much more than 60 minutes quite often because obviously if you're making a film as, as cheaply as possible in order to comply with the law really you don't want to make a film longer than 60 minutes because that's going to cost you money and actually you can see that um quite often in the pacing of the films so quite a lot of for instance um the films that george pearson makes uh for um uh, julius hagen films like a shot in the dark um they're very slow. There's a sense in which it's quite clear that they don't really have enough script to fill out 60 minutes and the actors are delivering their lines as slowly as possible to sort of pad out the, the, the running time of the film. But there's also the opposite is often the case. So, and this is a feature of Bernard Vorhaus's films quite a lot, particularly the ghost camera, I think, where um, uh, they spend quite a lot of time setting up the kind of you know the mystery and the drama um and then like it, you're starting to hit 60 minutes and they're like okay you know let's just let's just telescope everything from now and there's a kind of bit in the ghost camera where all the kinds of plot that you would expect to see played out on the screen is just described in a radio kind of news bulletin um so the the, the films do feature these sorts of like completely sort of imbalanced pacing kind of uh, activities. Um, the other really obvious thing uh, that Quota Quickies feature um, as a result of the fact that they're super cheap is uh, cheap sets, you know, that, 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 that quite often um, they, they, they make do with the corner of a room, you know, a setting as a corner of the room. And that's a feature of this film here, um, uh, a Death at Broadcasting House, which is actually a relatively expensive Quota Quickie, um, but they it's all set in Broadcasting House, but of course, Broadcasting House, they don't go and film there. Um, they film the corners of rooms that could be studios. And they're very clearly, you can see here how they've sort of uh, worked quite hard with the lighting and the shadows to indicate that it's a radio studio without really anything fundamental in the setting. You can see that the microphone is very prominent and the shadow of the microphone is very prominent. Um, the lighting uh, cameraman for that is a guy called... Um, uh, Gunther Kramp, um, who actually, you know, had been the cameraman for uh, Nosferatu and for, uh, I think, The Hands of All Act for a, a series of, you know, quite famous German expressionist uh, films. And this is a good example of, um, uh, you know, when he first comes to the UK, he's like looking for work and he just takes what he can get. And what he can get is a relatively low budget British photo quickie film. Um, uh, here's another example of a sort of brilliant piece of lighting design that basically um, uh, kind of, you know, uh, means that you don't have to spend that much money on sets. Here they are in brief ecstasy. Um, uh, and obviously they're at a nightclub, but the nightclub, actually you do get in some of the other shots, you get some indications of a, of a kind of nightclub set. But here, I mean, they don't have to employ a saxophonist. They could just have some extra, like making the shadow of a saxophone play, player. And you know, so the whole band is sort of expressed um, through very economic kind of shadow work, I guess. Um, uh, the other thing I've already mentioned, the way in which uh, Hagen's company reuses sets the whole time um, uh, for different productions, and uh, you know they just sort of dress them slightly differently. So that's another kind of feature of how uh, uh, quota quickies might look. Um, and the third thing, I guess, is obviously this is all about speed. It's all about making making films as fast as possible. So quite often you get sequences where um, actors fluff takes. You know they fluff their lines, um, but you know, there's no reshooting. You don't do anything about that. You just carry straight on. Um, and you can see that in numerous uh, 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 quota quickies. And the final thing I think to think about, I've talked a little bit about some of the kind of uh, key editing, kind of key people who worked in editing, David Lean famously started editing quota quickies. And actually, of course, when you are padding out information or when you're telescoping uh, the footage that you've got in order to tell a story, editing is quite important. And you can see some quite interesting editing techniques uh, used in Quota Quickies um, that are basically in the service of that process that, you know, the, the, the editor's got the material, knows that they can't reshoot stuff and actually has to sort of has to has to tell a story through the editing. There's quite a lot of instances in Quota Quickies where they use kind of really straightforward Soviet kind of Kuleshov montage effects to convey a car crash or something where they can't really film a car crash, but they can film, you know, the headlights and the, you know, the surprised face of the of the passenger and so forth and so on. So there's quite a lot of use of that. Um, I've got an example here, which is actually from the ghost camera. Um, which is obviously has been planned in advance, but is a very elegant way, I guess, of um, indicating uh, a shift in time. Let me see if I can 
pull that up. Um, so it's a it's a it's a it's a it's a scene in a uh, in a law court, um, and uh, here we well, go. Well, members of the jury, you've heard the evidence, and it is for you to determine how the deceased met his death. Three verdicts are open to you: death by accident, suicide, or murder. If you decide that it is murder. It is open to you to say by whose hand. And in this connection, I am compelled to draw your attention to the weight of evidence against Ernest Elton. Confronted with the testimony of several other witnesses, after repeated denials, Mr. Elton finally admitted connivance in the jewel theft, which appears to have supplied the motive for the death we are investigating. Mr. Elton also admitted his presence at the place where the body was found. Members of the jury, have you arrived at a verdict? We have. What is your verdict? Willful murder against Ernest Elton. So you can see that's a very, I mean, on, on some level, the pacing is a bit odd. So you get all this sort of stuff of um, uh, Felix Alma summing up, which actually is information you don't really need um, while the camera slowly goes around the courtroom. Um, and then with the information you really do need, it's all expressed through the, through, through the, through the, through the guy drawing the, the courtroom artist. Um, and there's a sense in which you can sort of, you can imagine that actually, um, I mean, it may be that Vorhaus, you know, had that idea and was like, oh, yes, we're going to do it this way. Or it could be that they just didn't have the coverage of, you know, they realized that they needed him, you know, the information that he was being um, uh, convicted. And they just didn't, they hadn't remember, they hadn't filmed that as part of the courthouse scene. So actually, that is the solution to, to telling that story. I mean, Quota Quick is a full of that kind of um, uh, decision, that kind of uh, filmmaking activity and of course I mean I think you know there's a there's there's a there's a Hitchcock uh, film where actually that exact thing happens and people are like oh this is the most marvelous thing ever Hitchcock's such a genius and here it is in a quote in a you know quote a quickie which you know everybody at the time thought was you know the most kind of rancid you know crappy movie that could possibly be imagined so I mean it's quite interesting to kind of think about those distinctions okay finally I just want to talk a little bit about um who these quota quickies might have appealed to, how they might have circulated in cinemas, um, uh, and like, I suppose, to answer the question, well, are they the worst films ever made? I mean, obviously, I don't think they are. I think, I think they're fab, but, you know, um, there are ways in which one can argue that um, uh, quota quickies are important and worth seeing, I guess. Um, but just to start with that, to go back to that sort of quotation from uh, uh, that comment of Michael Balkans that, you know, they were only ever shown in the cinemas when the cleaners were in. Um, there's a sort of, there's a rhyme of that in this uh, item from Kinematograph Weekly, you can see from 1933, uh, where they talk about, you know, the sort of the clever, the clever sinking of the sound um, with the opening of the quota quickie, um, i.e. which suggests, and obviously the joke is, um, in this little snippet that, you know, the quota quickies were really a point where you went to sleep when you were in the cinema. Um, and that sort of, I suppose that chimes with lots of the ways in which um, uh, people have talked about quota quickies. Certainly those people like um, uh, uh, Vorhaus, but particularly Pearson and LV talk about working in quota quickies as being sort of awful and, and, and actually that, I mean, I suppose it's a, quite a shaming experience, um, but also that the, the, they talk about the films not being wanted. But actually, if you go back to the um, original material to the newspapers, there's not conclusive evidence for that. Um, this article about Quokka Quicks is 1933 is the only article that a uh, 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 search for the phrase quota quickie pulls up for 1933. Um, and this is the kind of peak of Quota Cookie production 1933. This is the point at which all of the films um, that we've been discussed are circulating in cinemas or in the trade papers being advertised to 
by the distributors to cinemas. Um, and actually, some of those adverts are really telling. You know, they RKO's uh, uh, Julius Hagen quote of quickies, particularly things like "Say It with Flowers" um, and the ghost camera. Uh, they don't. You would expect. You know, if RKO had only had these films made so that they could comply with the letter of the law and they weren't expecting them to be booked into cinemas, you'd expect them not to make much, much, you know, much business of them. They'd be like, here we have these fabulous, you know, Fred and Ginger movies, RKO musicals with Fred Astaire. Ta -da, and here's our six RKO musicals that you can choose from. But he's like, oh, yeah, and some few quoted quickies over here. It's like, you, we don't care about that, nor do you. That's not how they advertise them at all. Um, uh, uh, um, Say It With Flowers, for instance, goes out into cinemas at around the same time as King Kong. And RKO's advert basically says, you know, we have given you the fabulous success of King Kong, and now we're giving you Say It With Flowers. It's going to be amazing. Um, so they really like, really push these films as though they are, you know, completely viable movies. Um, for Say It With Flowers, in fact, um, RKO arranges a, a, a tie up with uh, uh, what was then a kind of early version of Interflora, um, where cinemas could tie up with local um, uh, florists and, you know, the florists would provide flower displays in the foyers and uh, they would also advertise the film and the cinema in their own uh, in their own shop window. So there's a sense in which this idea that these are unwanted films just doesn't really sort of follow through in the advertisements and in the trade papers. Um, this one, this example of uh, like this being the only mention from 1933, after this mentions increase and, you know, so there's a few more mentions in 1934 and actually quite often they are, these mentions are describing to readers what a quota quickie is kind of thing that happens in the fan magazines as well around 1934. By 1935, 1936, there is a lot of discussion of quota quickies and how, oh, you know, these are terrible quota quickies and we have to sort of, you know, we need to, we need to find ways of getting around the law so that we don't, you know, these no longer are viable things to be making. But of course, um, a lot of that discussion is coming from the pucker by from the Michael Balkans, who have no incentive to keep quota quickies because, in fact, they are producing big, expensive British British, British films, and the the British offer from rivals like RKO, you know, is is a, is competition for uh, Michael Balkan and his outfit. Um, and also these this discussion increases, of course, because. The Films Act of 1928 is coming to an end and is going to be renewed in 1938. And so there is actually a lot of discussion about, you know, what the new act should look like and how it can be tweaked in order to avoid the worst excesses of uh, of sort of abuses um, of of the quota system. But the quota system doesn't get abolished at all. So it's, it, it runs uh, for a further 10 years. Um, and there are elements of the new act that are designed to stop the worst excesses but quota quickies still really exist i think in the in the in the late 1930s and in the into the 1940s um here i've got an example of some of the ways in which um uh these films were distributed and it's quite easy to see this is the example of uh sweeney todd um and sweeney todd in fact was um i said that mgm were the kind of worst people for booking for, for like silent films that they just knew would never get uh, distributed by the by this period um uh they have uh, got a contract with a guy called George King who's a quota quickie producer and George King uh, has um uh, with him Todd Slaughter and Todd Slaughter is this kind of really interesting figure really he's a major theatre star, he's not a major theatre star, he's a big theatre star. He starts out making, uh, doing productions in the Elephanton Castle Theatre, which are effectively revivals of Victorian melodramas, things like the Demon Barber of Fleet Street, um, things like Mariah Martin and the Murder in the Red Barn. And he revives those uh, melodramas kind of straight almost, like, you know, as, as period pieces. Um, and he's incredibly successful and then tours and he's like really he's one of those people who tours around the provinces all the time so he's a regular he comes back to your local theater with his new production of a new victorian melodrama um and it's those that get filmed uh, as part of mgm's quota quickie offer um and you can see here some some examples of how they get into cinemas and sometimes they are as a double bill. So here, Potluck 
at the top here uh, showing that the empire uh, is a tom walls ralph lynn so that's a sort of pucker british film uh, produced by a major company um that is going to sort of make money and uh, and uh, it shows when it's showing daily and also included on the bill is todd slaughter and the demon barber of fleet street so it, i think it's kind of fair to say that that's a double bill but notice uh, it's a double bill both british films um so it's not a it's not an american headliner with a kind of crappy british b picture at all um uh the second example at the ramsgate picture house todd slaughter in demon barber of fleet street um is the main feature you know it is the it is the big it is the big film at ramsgate um for that part of the week um uh and obviously ramsgate picture house uh, is a small seaside town picture house it's an independent it's not part of a part of a big uh, cinema chain so that's uh, one thing and then here at the roxy um uh in bradford i think no i think it's the empire that's in bradford it's the roxy that's in coventry um uh it's showing as the second half of a of a week split so the Spencer Tracy film shows in the first half of the week and the Todd Slaughter film shows in the second half of the week. So again, it's not a B picture matching an A picture, uh, matching an American A picture. It is being it is being shown as a film in its own right, um, as a single as a single feature. So, I mean, I think that sort of that kind of distribution pattern sort of gives the lie to the idea that somehow they, they are their B pictures or their secondary material. I mean, yes, they are secondary material. They are not going to be opening in London's glittering West End as a main A picture. But in, in a small cinema in Ramsgate, they certainly are going to be the main attraction for, you know, four days. Who was watching these films? Well, I suppose one thing to say about them is, like, what is the taste? Well, you know, who, who might they appeal to? Um, and I mean, most importantly, I guess, um, they, I would suggest, they appeal to audiences to whom Hollywood films don't necessarily appeal. Um, and in fact, what you get is you get, I mean, I think there's a, there's a, there's quite a big strand of quota quickies. I mean, I suppose a key thing about them is that they're inexportable. So what they do is they showcase British culture in a way that isn't really going to be attractive to export audiences is not going to be attractive to American audiences. So they're very specific, I guess, in their cultural address. That's one key thing. Um, Sweeney Todd, obviously, it's a very specifically British idea and being done as a Victorian melodrama revival, you know, that's not necessarily going to appeal to American audiences. Mariah Martin, I mean, obviously, American audiences will have heard of Sweeney Todd because of, but not necessarily, I don't think at this period, not before the Sondheim uh, film. At the Sondheim musical, but like Mariah Martin, The Red Barn, another one of these uh, Todd Slaughter things. Well, nobody in America's ever heard of that and still probably hasn't. Um, they also showcase um, uh, uh, music hall acts and comedy acts that are very specifically British. So, for instance, um, uh, Fox, uh, Fox British at Wembley make a whole series of films starring Max Miller. Um, uh, who obviously is a highly kind of British kind of uh, uh, comic. Only a few of them survive, so don't get too excited because actually a lot of them have been lost. Um, and uh, Joe Rock, uh, uh, another quota quickie producer, um, makes a whole series of films with a comic called Leslie Fuller, uh, who is actually brilliant. I mean, I think they're brilliant films. Um, but they're, he's a he's 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 a he's basically an end of the peer comic. Um, and uh, uh they really have very little appeal out i mean you, know, you can imagine they would very have very little appeal outside of the uk so the sense in which um these films are appealing to particularly british audiences using particularly british kind of cultural objects acts musical acts um uh and sort of familiar um uh, uh texts um uh that wouldn't be attractive uh, elsewhere but also they're appealing to older audiences, I think, quite a lot. Um, and we tend to kind of always, and indeed I think film producers, certainly in America, always think of the film going public as being sort of between, you know, 14 and 24. Um, and these films are really clearly pitched at people who are, you know, 
in their 50s and over, I would say. Um, hence the, the, the Sweeney Todd material, the kind of Victorian uh, revival stuff. There's a brilliant film that we're showing in the series, Say It With Flowers, which literally just gets musical, famous musical acts from 30 years previously and, you know, shows, I mean, there's a storyline which is all about, you know, putting on a show, but the show they put on is a whole series of musical stars from the from around the first world war period and and one of the key things that i think is an, an attraction of these films for today is that they preserve those performances you know and if the quota act hadn't existed you know they those performances wouldn't have been filmed they wouldn't have been preserved that's similar with uh, with the todd slaughter uh, film as well so i think actually i've kind of made an argument that they're kind of fab and you should watch them so come along and watch them and thank you for listening to me Okay, that was fabulous. Um, you can maybe, yeah, brilliant. We've got the um, information about the events. Um, that was absolutely fabulous. That was really fascinating. We've got loads of questions, but first I just have to get in a quick plug for other events that we've got coming up. So um, next, um, next, no, not next week, it's the week after, 21st of April, we've got one called Im empowered minds about the beat generation jack kerouac and stuff and i think that'd be very good and then we've got one on the 26th of april um called contrary journey which is about um jews in 18th century europe and i think it's got a special it's especially focusing on ukraine which is something i think we're all interested in at the moment and coming up on uh an advance warning on wednesday the 18th of may we have Stephen Smith, who some of you all know. He did some talks on Casablanca recently, and he's talking about Olivia de Havilland. So um, do book, but don't book yet because you won't be listening to these questions. Okay. Um, one of the things that um, people are asking, because people are very keen on this, is where do people see these films? Um, quite a lot on YouTube, I, I notice. But yes, I mean, a lot of them on YouTube. Um, there's also quite a few of, I mean, Talking Pictures TV does show them quite a lot. And actually, if you look on the Talking Pictures TV Encore section, it's always worth having a look. I mean, I guess the, the problem is like, how do you recognise that they are quite quickies, which is something I kind of tried to address there. But I think actually that thing about, you know, if they're British and they're made in the 1930s and they're between an hour and an hour and 10 minutes long, then you that's a pretty good bet that they're quota quickie. And, okay. and, and Talking Pictures TV used to show them sort of like just before six o'clock in the morning. So like if you were awake at between five and six, you could see them then. A lot of them are on YouTube and actually a lot of them are now, or some of them are now available on, on DVD. So um, yeah, if you know what titles to look for, you, like you will find the network and um, uh, I can't, uh, Renown are the two uh, DVD labels that tend to tend to have them. Yes, Network have now put out, I think, basically all of Ealing pretty well. It's a couple yeah. of, and so the Ealing 30s ones, like Brief Ecstasy, and a series called the Ealing Rarities Season. Yes, and actually a lot of those. Very good, you get the full film, four films uh, on DVD for about eight quid. So. Uh, and there's also, I mean, they also have a series of, I mean, not that I'm being paid by them to advertise, but they have a series of British comedies where they have like two or three films in each disc. And they have a series of British musicals, mm. and in all of the mix of those films of those uh, sets, they tend to have, uh, you know, Kota Cricket is one of the films at least. Mm. Yeah, yeah. Someone's asking about the screenings, but someone's very kind. Yeah, Dominic has very kindly posted a link uh, to that. They they are just screenings, aren't they? I don't think they'll be recorded. It's just a screen, just a normal. Well, it's a, yeah, it's a screening, um, and then the, there's a discussion afterwards, and that is recorded as part of the podcast that that Dom produces. So, um, like you, you, you know, if you can't come see the films, actually, you know, full disclosure most of the films are available most of the films that we're showing are available in other media it's not like these are the only ways you're going to be able to see them yes we'll see. death of broadcasting oh. house is definitely one that network has yeah. done and that's that's very interesting that's um the star is val gilgood who's john gilgood's brother who was a radio producer um so he's not actually an actor but it is a radio producer he's playing himself and it is very interesting that one um okay um Tim Folan says, um, I assume the market in the British Empire was quite large. Was there too much US competition there too? 
Um, yeah, that's a good question, actually. Uh, um, uh, the empire is a real sort of like, it, like a real major part of the reason why this uh, why this legislation gets passed is because of concerns about the empire. So one of the, I mean, one of the kind of key quotes um, in the debate about the quota of uh, the quota act is from Ramsay MacDonald, who basically says, you know. Um, uh, you know these terrible American films are showing around the empire, and it, like, what are they doing? They are showing they are showing white people acting in ways that you know I would be ashamed to think that are you know that are um, uh, people in the empire are, co are, are colonized uh, uh, peoples would imagine that they act. So there's this idea that somehow Hollywood films are bringing white people into disrepute among the uh, among the colonies, um, and that's the reason why. You know, they think we should be distributing British films across the empire. But actually, um, uh, the, the, in quite a lot of places in the empire, it, like it's it's only the colonists that get to go to the cinema. Um, so that's sort of one issue I think about empire production. There's a whole other situation in India where um, they 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 have a they have a kind of commission where they interview the whole of the Indian film industry, the kind of the exhibitors and the distributors and the producers trying to basically make a case for the quota to apply in India. Um, and of course, India already by this time has quite a big uh, film industry of itself, of its own. Um, and of course, what they find is there's a lot of resistance from the Indian uh, producers and exhibitors to the idea of a British quota. And it, it doesn't quite get off the ground, really. Mm. And I can't, I mean, to be honest, I guess if you are Australian, you know, there's no particular reason why you're going to be interested in Gert and Daisy or whatever, <laughs> just because, or Don Slaughter, just because your grandparents came from England. It's not. I mean, yes and no. I think there's quite a lot of our grandparents come from England and therefore it's part of our home culture. Um, but uh, I mean, the same situation that pertains in Australia, of course, you know, most of the films that they're seeing are American films and you know, the appetite is for American films. And I mean, there is a there is a kind of small Australian uh, 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 industry that is kind of surviving there, but um, uh, mainly they're getting exported films. Someone anonymous says, could you name some examples of the worst films? So which ones would you think are terrible? I mean, the shot in the dark, which, is, which I have seen, The Shot in the Dark is really quite bad. But... <laughs> Shot in the Dark is a sort of, yes, I mean, Shot in the Dark is bad in a kind of like, you know, they really are eking out the plot and it's really slow and badly acted. And, but I mean, you know, it's, it's right, I think. I mean, um, but I mean, there are other ones where you sort of think, well, uh, I mean, the Todd Slaughter ones, you might think, well, this is quite bad. It's really very straightforward, very stagey. Um, uh, but also highly entertaining and mainly because of uh, Slaughter's performance. Um, the and then there are other people like Jerry Verno films where you just sort of think, oh God, this is really tedious. You know, it's quite high quality in terms of its production values compared to some of the other ones. But like this, this actor is not interesting. I think some of the Todd Slaughter ones, especially Maria Martin, it actually starts with them doing a curtain call, doesn't it? They'll all introduce, and it's a bit like kind of a 1930s version of one of those NT live broadcasts, because it is capturing exactly, you know, it's the closest thing you're going to get to see Todd Slaughter on stage. Yeah, um, I mean, I think that's, that, I mean, that's one of the attractions of them. They are historical objects, um, and they preserve a culture which, you know, would be lost otherwise. Um, I so, yeah, I, I mean, I, I, when I first got into them, I thought, oh, you know, they're going to be utterly unwatchable and grim. And I was astonished to find how actually, how totally watchable they were. Obviously, they're not of the quality of a Hollywood film of this period, but they're, but they're you know, they're, 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 they're filmmakers clearly want you to enjoy them. I the filmmakers Michael, kind of care. Michael Powell says something about his reputation went down every time one of his quota quickies was rediscovered. But actually, many people would say that his quite quickies are really enjoyable. I mean, you know, the Phantom Light or um, the Fire Raisers, which is on YouTube, or um, whatever the one about Red the steel. Sign. Yeah, there's quite the a lot about of shipbuilding. Is Red Ensign that they're really interesting? Yes, I mean they're really interesting. I wouldn't have said they were great. <laughs> <laughs> I watched Red Ensign this afternoon, and you know, it, it is quite interesting, but it is a bit sort of. Yeah, no, it's, it's, I mean, it's definitely what it is, you know, it's definitely a, a low budget early production. 
of towels. Yeah. Um, someone, uh, Doug says, was Merton Park production a consequence of the quota quickie industry uh, because it was geographically close to Teddington and Twickenham? Yes, um, I'm not sure about Merton Park yet, but yes, I think it was. And of course, I mean, one of the key things I mean, about British cinema as a whole, but as a uh, of quote of quickest too, is that is that all the studios cluster around London, um, and I mean that that helps both quota producers and uh, kind of pucker producers in that you know you can employ West End actors and they can actually you know they can they can do a bit of work in the studio and then they can go back and 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 do their show um, and that's something that's quite often said in the 30s and the 40s you know when people are saying how terrible British cinema is there you know they're arguing that it's really staging and that relies on these kind of stage actors and their kind of their kind of mannered performances um, uh, I mean, I'm not sure what the specific history of Merton Park is, but those sorts of those sorts of later low budget uh, kind of 1950s Merton Park productions, you know, they are kind of off. They are they are kind of continuation, really, of the kind of quota quickie style, I would say. It's Mona says, absolutely fascinating. I worked in the film industry for more than 20 years and never knew about quota quickies. So was it something that was like kept secret? Was it was it like this sort of forgotten thing that people wanted to push onto the carpet? It's hard to, I mean, it's hard to unpack really. I mean, my suspicion is that quota quickies as a phrase only really, as I sort of mentioned in the talk, only really becomes something that's heavily discussed like when the act is about to be renewed in 1938. And before that, people had just sort of like got on with it. Um, and they knew that there were these low budget things, but they weren't really described as quota quickies. They got named as quota quickies by film journalists, particularly, I think, P.L. Manock, who is the kind of studio correspondent uh, in the fan magazines and in Kinematograph Weekly. And it's part of an attempt to make sure that the new act, you know, is different. Um, but also, like they then become synonymous with the idea that British cinema is really crap. And obviously we're kind of all familiar with that idea, uh, you know, as, as, shall we say a certain generation of people uh, uh, ahead of us always had the conception that all of British cinema was a load of old nonsense. Um, and quite often that, it, it, you know, the idea of quota quickies was used by them. So for instance, I mean, I remember hearing an interview with Larry Adler where he described Genevieve, Genevieve as a quota quickie. He said, oh, you know, it was just a British picture. It was a quota quickie. And it's like, well, I mean, obviously it was not, but it, it got used sort of in the 60s as just sort of blanket dismissal of the whole of British cinema of basically the entire previous period. Um, so like the term and the way it gets used, you know, changes over time and is quite slippery, I think. Mm. Um, Stephanie Green said, says, is there anyone we now know as good that appeared in these films? Wow, give a list. <laughs> <laughs> I, I mean, in terms of actors and actresses, yeah, there's loads of people. You know, Jack Hawkins rocks up in loads of early quota quickies. Um, uh, John Mills is in quite a few. You know, Nikki's favourite Felix Alma is obviously appeared in that clip and, you know, he has a long career as a character actor and is much loved by certain librarians of our acquaintance. Um, so, yeah, I mean, it, it, it's definitely a kind of training ground. And the, I mean, like some of those Michael Powell quoted quickies, actually, if you look at them, they are, they're Gaumont productions. So there are sort of names that are relatively familiar in the production team. Alfred Jung gets a credit in, the, in Red Ensign as the, as the, as the um, set designer. You know, obviously Alfred Jung is massively respected and was at the time mm -hmm. as a kind of major kind of pucker designer. And um, Gunther Kramp, I mentioned, lots of people, you know, are in quota quickies and then it's like a training ground for them and they go on to make um, uh, much more sort of respectable films, um, both actors and and behind the camera. Yes, I noticed one of the pictures you showed was Ian Hunter, who just probably a couple of years before he went to Hollywood and he's King Richard in the eventual Robin Hood. Yes. Q uh, Williams is another who's in the Wuthering, who's in Wuthering Heights with uh, Lance Olivier. So yeah, if you... If you're working in the 30s in the film industry, you'd sooner or later have to be in a quota quickie because that was what was being filmed. Absolutely, yeah. Um, I think, I mean, even, um, I mean, Robert Donat did some at the beginning of his career. 
I yeah. think only one of them survives. It got rediscovered a few years ago. So and Ida Lupino, of course, is is like I mean, she's about sixteen when the ghost camera comes out, and 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 she's the sort of main female character in that. And then you know she becomes a major star. Well, I mean, she becomes a star, um, and she goes to Hollywood, and then she becomes a filmmaker herself. So yes, um, Barbara talks about um, well names autobiography, where he spends quite a bit of time reminiscing about quoted quickies. Um, it provided employment for all sorts of people who made more money, who made more money during that time, as well as learning their craft. And so, and Ronald Neem, yeah, he he made loads of um, distinguished films in the fifties uh, and sixties, didn't he? Yeah, I mean, he's sort of behind all those cine guild films, you know, the Grief Encounters and the and the Great Expectations and so forth. Yes, yes. Is there a, a list of quoted quickies online or in books? I mean, it's worth. Could you say something about some books because there are. A few very good books. Sorry, yes. There. I mean, there is, yeah, there's, the, 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 I suppose the major study of Quoted Quickies is, is by Steve Chibnall. Um, and it's called, I think it's called Quoted Quickies, Britain's B Pictures, or something like that. And he yeah, has he a wrote, He wrote two volumes, one yeah, about... Yeah, there's a volume on the third, which is the Quoted Quickies volume, yeah. and then the 40s and 50s. And they're not really Quoted Quickies by the, by the 50s because there is no quota act by that point. You know, there's no... There's no, it's a completely different kind of mechanism. They change the mechanism. Um, but obviously they are B pictures. They are kind of low budget movies. Um, but his 30s volume, I think does contain a, a pretty uh, substantial filmography. And he's saying the similar kinds of things in, in that book where he's sort of saying, well, you know, if you look at the ways in which these films are distributed, like there are certain films that are really successful and really kind of clearly, you know, people like, and they get revived and they come back and, and they are the main uh, uh, features in their cinemas. Um, I mean, I think there's a sort of sense in which our conception of how exhibition was in those days is a bit kind of blanket, you know, it's kind of dominated by the idea of like super fab picture palaces with, you know, um, atmospheric kind of constructions and big cafes and everything. But actually a lot of cinemas were quite small, kind of elderly, very local, and they wouldn't necessarily have been showing the big Hollywood films. They may well have been showing these quite kind of modest films as their main offer for the week. Yes, Melissa makes a point that Quota Quickies um, are kind of proving ground in the same way that now there's TV ads and also soap operas that where you find yeah. people. Um, the, you could say they're the neighbours of the 1930s. Yes, absolutely. Um, Nigel Gale asks about the 1960s documentaries like um, this always comes up in this sort of discussion. Harold Bames, Telly Savalas visits Birmingham, which is a real thing, everybody. It's on YouTube, I think. Um, I, I, that's the Ed Le Levy, isn't it? Which I've never quite yeah. understood, but I'm sure you can explain. Yeah, the Ed Levy is basically a tax on the box office, on the on the ticket price of cinemas, and it goes into a fund, um, which is basically like a kind of production fund. So it's a bit. I mean, you know, if you imagine, it's a bit like how it operates now except instead of the lottery, the national lottery existing and being the, the source of that money, you know, it's the ED levy, the money is taken from uh, tickets at the box office, the, the price of box office tickets. Um, Alison O'Neill asks, uh, did, this is, I think, reference MGM sort of showing silent films and things, did they get away with it? Did people not complain? That yeah. I mean, they did sort of get away with it. I mean, I think they they, they kind of realised that it wasn't going to be viable as a policy later on, and that's why they sort of make the make the deal with. It's not George. I said George King in the thing, but it's George Smith that they make the deal with, who is the producer of those Todd sort of films. Um, I mean, and I guess there's a sense in which that transition to sound means that actually, if you want to abuse the thing, you have quite a lot of leeway to do it because there's a lot of silent films knocking around that haven't really had proper exposure, you know, because sound appeared before they were finished. Um, and so if you carry those films, you can say, well, I, I, I completely legitimately, you know, got all these films on my books and, you know, it's not my fault that sound has sort of taken over. Um, whereas later on, it's less possible. Um, and then there's another sort of way in which people do it. I mean, but I mean, you know, the, the cinemas can be prosecuted for breaking the, for not showing enough quota. Um, and the distributors can be prosecuted for not showing enough quota. And although there are some prosecutions, there are remarkably few. I mean, there are lots of warnings, um, you know, and kind of, you know, written warnings and so forth. Um, but there aren't that many people who get taken to court and are fined for it, for, for, for abusing the Quota Act, for not showing films. Yes, who, who took them to court? Was it responsible of the local councils or...? 
I think it would have been the Board of Trade who took them to court. And did people really go around and check? I mean, I yes. I mean, I think there would have been the 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 watch the watch committees would have logged the films that were being made. I imagine. Um, and as I say, there are there are records for 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 who gets told off but doesn't actually go to court. Um, Stuart Smith asked about uh, Frank Randall and also Butcher's Studios. Are they quite quickies? They uh, yeah, I mean, I think, I mean, it's like, uh, like I was saying, it's like, I don't think Frank Randall was actually, hard, I don't know who the, who the people renting Frank Randall films to the exhibitors were, but Frank Randall films wouldn't have existed if the Quota Act hadn't existed hmm. because there wouldn't have been the space in the cinemas to kind of give them a foothold I guess I mean obviously once they get into the cinemas they're pretty popular um in well I mean they're popular in the northwest yeah yes I'm not sure they really played in south london not, not playing in south london now I don't think so no. um Ken's Mac asks was the formation of studio distribution combines like uh, rank studios um and their cinemas and associated British pictures and ABC. Was that a deliberate attempt to emulate the Hollywood uh, studio exhibition model to get bigger and better British films into the cinema, like Genevieve? Uh, yes, I mean, I think, you know, Rank is, is a classic example of a, of a vertically integrated company. You know, they own the chains of cinemas, they own Odeon at one point, um, they take over ABPC in the middle of the war, uh, you know, they are owning the they, the, the, you know, they are the distributors of their own films, and they are also the the producers of their films. Um, and of course, I mean, there's a sort of the, there's a sense in which like companies like Rank and Gomont British that kind of precede. I mean, because Rank kind of takes over from Gomont British, really, as the kind of main vertically integrated company. Um, like, they make all these British films. They make all these pucker British films. But actually, you know, the money that they're making is from distributing American films. You know, Odeon is not a chain which only shows British film. It shows mainly American films. So they themselves are a sort of, you know, they are subject to the act, as it were. Alison points out that uh, Frank Randall was popular just in the north, not just the northwest, because her mum used to quote quote him, and she came from Sunderland. So. <laughs> So we shouldn't be so, well, well um, uh, Lawrence comes from Newcastle and I'm sure he's always quoting Frank Randall. Um, <laughs> Susan asked, did any of them, any of the Quota Quickies utilize Pinewood Studios for locations? Uh, Pinewood is built slightly later, I believe. Pine and, is, uh, Pinewood like kind of emerges in the late thirties early 40s, kind of 38, I think. Um, I mean, there's a whole complicated history there where, I mean, effectively the financing for the British film industry collapses in about 1937 after this kind of boom, partly as a result of the act, partly a result of uh, private life of Henry VIII. There's, a kind of, there's this filmmaking boom. I mean, it turns out that obviously a lot of the films that are being made are not that successful and the financing collapses around 1938. That's the point where Rank emerges and starts sort of buying up studios and buying up cinema chains um, and kind of like consolidates uh, kind of his world. Um, and it's part of it's part of Rank's organisation that Pinewood gets built, I think. Um, so it's a bit late. Um, I suppose is what I'm saying. It's a bit late for quota quickies. Well, I think we've come to the end of our questions. So I'm just going to say thank you so much for that. That was really brilliant. There's loads of lovely comments. Um, so thank you all for attending. And we'll look forward to seeing you at our next event. So good night. Good night.